Hey everyone, I'm Sinai, your 4 star guy. And what kind of 4 star guy would I be if I didn't have a level 80 Amber? When I was making my first waltz around Dragonspine, I used Amber as my carry the whole time, saying that she's the best character and all. And although it was initially a joke, as I leveled her up thinking that it was a silly waste of level up materials, she quickly became a main DPS I could actually rely on. Dragonspine has introduced some enemies that have cryo shields, so having Amber as a power character was helpful here. But these enemies also got put into the Spiral Abyss, making her useful even there. Trying her out made me realize that she is a great character to use Melt and Vaporize reactions. I can say that I recommend her and that she's great, but if you have Deluca Klee, well, damn, I, I don't think Amber will help you much here. Amber's taunt skill still barely hits enemies because its AoE is so small and enemies can still walk out of her ultimate before they even feel any bane. But I think that the thing that changed for me was tossing her skills to the side for the most part and finding a way to play just around her charge attacks. In this video, I will give you guys tips on how to build her and a team comp that I think is both accessible and optimal to make Amber a legitimate DPS option. <laughs> Let's get into some of the big ideas on what can make Amber do damage. Melt and Vaporize are two reactions that multiply the damage of the attack that triggered it. This usually means that singular big power hits maximize the damage amplified compared to many instances of smaller hits. This is because we can amplify one big attack using these reactions. But after that reaction, the enemy will no longer be affected by Cryo or Hydro, meaning that the rest of the attacks will not be amplified. This kind of kicks her ultimate out of the picture for melt damage, but her charge shot is a reliable way to get semi-big melt hits off that we can do over and over. Charge attacks on weak spots from bow users also deal critical damage every time. With these factors in mind, the stats we want to focus on are crit damage, elemental mastery, and attack. We want to raise our critical damage to boost our damage on weak points. The amount that melt and vaporize multiplies our damage is boosted by elemental mastery. And attack would boost the base amount of damage that these other stats will amplify. We don't need crit rate since getting a critical hit is already guaranteed if we land our headshots. The Wanderer's Troop Artifact Set boosts our Elemental Mastery by 80 and increases our charge attacks damage by 35%. It's a win-win. The Crimson Witch of Flames is another artifact set I considered, but from my calculations, the Wanderer's Troop Set boosted our critical melt charge attacks damage more. As for the main stats of the artifacts, we want either attack percent or elemental mastery for the sands. We want about the same amount of rolls for these two sets, so they are relatively equally powerful. Go for whichever piece has the better subsets, or if you want to balance an already high attack with EM, and vice versa. Pyro damage bonus for the goblet, since we will always be doing pyro damage on her charge attacks, and crit damage on this for the circlet. We want as much crit damage as we can get. Even a 4 star crit damage circlet is better than a 5 star attack percent or EM one. I have compared 4 weapons, the 3 star sharpshooter's oath, the forgeable bow prototype crescent, the black cliff war bow that you can buy in the shop, and the 5 star Amos bow. There are a couple of other 3 stars that I considered. I chose not to calculate the messenger since its extra hit only procs once every 10 seconds. Either way, since the damage is split into 2 instances, I assume that this is weaker than the rest of the weapons since only one of those hits will melt and the effect doesn't happen often enough. The Raven Bow does extra damage against Hydro enemies, has Elemental Mastery as a subset, and has a high base power for 3 star bows, making it synergistic for Vaporize reactions. Even though I didn't think it would actually do well since the boosts were not substantial, I calculated it anyway, and it isn't one of the best bows. The Sharpshooter's Oath sets the standard for the bows I compared. Its crit damage boost and bonus damage on weak points really puts it over the edge. It is even better than the Prototype Crescent even when it does have the buff. Once you refine the Prototype Crescent, it does become stronger than the Sharpshooter, but only after you hit at least one charge shot on a weak point. Until you get to refinement rank 5, the Black Cliff War Bow is weaker than the Sharpshooter's Oath until you get 2 of its buffs, which requires you to kill 2 enemies. Even at refinement rank 1 though, the Black Cliff is stronger than the Sharpshooter once you get 2 of its buffs. The Almost Bow is just stronger, even without refinements or travel time buffs. If you have one, you're one lucky son of a bad word. To wrap up the talk about the weapons, the Sharpshooter's Oath is great and can outpace the 4 star weapons until you get their refinements and their buffs going. The Crescent's buff is more reasonable, only asking you to hit one charge attack on a weak point. But the Black Cliff's buff has more potential at its third stack, but requires you to kill 3 whole enemies, which could be asking a lot depending on who you're facing. The Almost Bow is just good. Your choice between the Sharpshooter and the 4 star bows can come down to your strategy and their accessibility for you. All 4 of these bows are great options. Now let's talk about a team to set Amber up. Kaya, Barbara, and Shen Yan is what I concluded to be the best team for Amber. Our team is all about making sure Amber can do melt and vaporize consistently. 
Kaya has a relatively short cooldown on his skill that afflicts enemies with cryo to set up melt reactions. I thought of Changyun here too, but afflicting enemies with cryo requires them to be in reach of his skill's field, and we can't do this to enemies that are far apart from each other. One of the main advantages of this team is being able to eliminate multiple enemies back to back without needing to approach them or group them together, saving time. I also found Kaya's ability to use his skill from a distance useful to set up Amber to charge her shot with enough space to not get hit and interrupted out of her charging animation, while Chongyun has to get very close to land his normal attacks. But Kaya's skill has a 5 second cooldown and we can fit in another charge shot in here. If we shoot the enemy again, they'll be propped with Pyro and the next time we use Kaya's skill, the cryo won't stick to the enemy, it will just do a melt using Kaya's damage. So, while Kaya's skill is on cooldown, we can switch to Barbara. She can proc enemies with Hydro, setting up Amber for a reverse vaporize shot. We can also pass on a Thrilling Tales of Dragon Slayer's buff to Amber in this process as well. These three would work as such. Kaya uses his skill to afflict enemies with Cryo, switch to Amber and use her charge shot on a weak point to do melt damage, switch to Barbara to apply Hydro onto the next target, then go to Amber to vaporize them, and repeat the process. You could use Diona as well I think, she has a 6 second cooldown on the tap version of her skill and can proc Cryo this way. One of my main reasons to use Barbara was because there are many times where the enemy is afflicted by Pyro. Whether that be because of the grass burning, we shoot an enemy after their cryo wore off, another one of our skills afflicted them with Pyro, and stuff like that. In those situations, we can't do a melt or vaporize reaction with Amber's charge shot, meaning we barely do damage until that Pyro status is removed and a cryo or hydro status is applied meaning we need multiple hits of cryo or hydro over time to cleanse and apply the status. This is why Barbara's normal attacks came to mind. It also has no cooldown, meaning we can use it to set up vaporize whenever we want. But when I thought about it, Kaya and Diona's ultimate also applies cryo over time, meaning that they can cleanse pyro and apply cryo using their ults. The only thing is that we may not have their ults charged whenever we need it, especially since Amber will barely be generating energy because we are not using skills with her. <laughs> I can imagine Diana's shield being useful to prevent Amber from getting hit and interrupted while charging her shot. Even though Reverse Vaporize doesn't do as much damage, with Barbara and the Thrilling Tails buff, it is really close anyway. For now, I'll recommend Barbara because her normal attacks are more convenient, and she's more accessible than Diana. I know this because I don't have her! Just keep in mind that we don't need Cryo Resonance for Amber at all, since for us, critical hits are already guaranteed. Because the team of 3 works so well on their own, in the last slot I figured that going for a power resonance would help us passively. I also noticed that our team is not really equipped to deal with slimes, since they don't have weak points and we can't choose what element they are afflicted with. And Heliochos and Mitochos with Geo Shields totally stump us. Not to mention the new Cryo Sassine Mage, who constantly generates her shield as long as her Sassine are alive, and whose Sassine whizz around before your arrows can actually even reach them, and even if you were totally aiming at them. God, I hate her. So we essentially wanted a secondary DPS character to deal with these and oh my god I'm still angry. But we don't want a character that spreads too much pyro so we don't melt enemies before Amber actually shoots them and make it harder for our hydro and cryo applicators to cleanse the pyro. Shangling has too much power going on and while having a damage boost from Bennett's ultimate is cool, I'm afraid that his ultimate's area of effect and desire to use his skill often for his own energy generation may cause pyro problems for us. Shinyan doesn't spread too much pyro, she has a shield that can benefit us like how I talked about with Diona, can slap slimes with her physical damage, and she has a claymore, letting her deal with those geo shields. Now that we have a second damage dealer, Crow Resonance may sound better, but I'd argue that Barbara's Thrilling Tails buff is more reliable and valuable anyway than needing to keep enemies afflicted with by Cryo. I bet you thought that we could also have some damage support in the form of Amino or Geo characters, and you'd be right, although I think the Veridus and Venner set is less effective than you may initially think. This is because for a lot of the normal mobs, Melt and Vaporize with Amber already one-shots them. If we want to use Swirl, we will need to afflict them with Pyro, probably using Amber's charge shots anyway since the Anemo character would take the place of the second Pyro character's place, Swirl them, apply Cryo or Hydro to them, probably needing to cleanse the Pyro first, then use your charge shot again. This is pretty overkill. For most enemies, just the basic melt with Pyro Resonance is already more than enough. We're spending time lowering the resistance on enemies who are already as good as dead. Even if we don't one shot them, one or two uncharged aim shots can finish them off. And this should still be quicker than trying to set up a swirl and everything. 
Also, be aware that some amino abilities would also make it harder to land charge attacks on weak spots too since these skills fling normal mobs around over time. That doesn't mean you can't be an epic gamer or something like that, that's just me. If you have faith in Amber's one-shot potential on normal mobs without the pyro resonance, your amino support can help you do more damage against bigger and tankier enemies. But using the archaic Petra set, we can use one charge shot on an enemy, then crystallize their pyro. Then our pyro damage is boosted for the next 10 seconds, no matter if we kill an enemy and aim at someone new or not. But to get the damage boost all the time, we would have to do this every 10 seconds. Geo damage also takes care of those geo shields we talked about before too, and anemo attacks would do swirl damage of an element slimes are immune to. Perhaps if you don't have Xin Yan, Ningguang is probably the most convenient option for a geo character since her catalyst attacks do geo damage, so she can constantly do geo damage without cooldowns whenever we need it. And Sucrose might be the best option for an anemo character since her elemental mastery boost ups our melt and vaporize damage. A Geo support would give us a little more damage in general than Power Resonance, while the Archaic Petra effect is active at least. But Power Resonance is by far the most convenient way to boost our damage. Using an Anemo character would probably get us the most damage, but it is the most situational, and cannot handle slimes or Geo shields well at all. Well, that was my Amber Guide. I hope you guys found this video helpful, or at the very least interesting. Consider subscribing if you want to see more Genshin Impact videos from me. I do character builds, team comps, tips, and the occasional compilation video. Thank you for checking out my channel either way, and see you next time.